Well, good morning, uh, or well, I should say good afternoon. Uh, I'm coming to you early September 2021. This is Dean Tinney coming to you from my studio in fabulous Las Vegas. Um, eight months ago, started this year, I started a uh, campaign to make a direct connection with test takers that wasn't dependent on their sponsoring firm or their test prep uh, vendor. Uh, I didn't know what my expectations were in that effort, but uh, exceeded my expectations in the minimum expectations I had. Uh, as I speak to you coming to you in September of 2021, we're uh, pretty close to 80,000 views on the YouTube channel and a couple thousand subscribers. So it's been great. The other thing that's happened over the course of those 18 months is we've had test takers who started with their SIE matriculated to their Series 7, matriculated to their 66 or 63. And uh, now we're, some of them were hired as management. And now they're going to be taking their Series 24. So uh, this will be the first installment on the Series 24 playlist. It's going to be market making. And the reason I chose marketing making, market making is the first installment is when I teach Series 24, there's many classes where all the people, all test takers pass. But when I lose somebody, it's usually not many, one or two persons per class at max, but they usually come from a packaged product background, mutual funds, and they struggle with the trading and the fiscal responsibility. So I thought, well, the first installment I'll make on the YouTube channel will be on market making. Uh, some of it's appropriate for 57. I'm going to put 57 there too. If you're a 57, you can ignore the stuff about net capital and get right into the thick of things. So this will be the first installment on uh, market making. Second installment will be fiscal responsibility, net capital. And I'll wait till I, uh, you know, I hear somebody saying, hey, Dean, I'd, I'd like some more content. It's the same thing that's happening right now in the 910. The 910, I've made the first installment on the explication of the test content. And uh, I've got a couple options lectures that are appropriate. And I'll wait until some of the nines and tens say, hey, how about some more content? <laughs> so that's kind of the game plan here. I always put it a header, and I'll do that after I get done with this lecture. I always put a header uh, to pass the Series 24, know the Series 24. So I'll put the Series content outline up there and explicate at least the introduction and explicate the right, uh, rest of it, you know, again, as we get to requests. Those of you been with the channel from your beginning know how that works. We do two things on the channel. Well, I should say three things. We do narrative lectures. This is going to be a narrative lecture. Uh, we do uh, practice uh, questions and practice exams, and we do explications explications of content where we just go through the content outlines as intellectual inventory. So that's kind of the game plan. So let's get started. Let me get the share screen. Share screen. Do, do, do. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is going to be market making appropriate for the Series 24 exam and the Series 57, which is the uh, training guy who's going to be managing this stuff. Uh, minimum net capital for market makers. So, you know, in the late 60s, we shut down a lot of brokerage firms and we couldn't find the customers' monies and securities. Public confidence in the securities industry was uh, seriously eroded. And uh, so, you know, we said those bankers are onto something. They got that sign out front that says FDIC, makes people feel warm and fuzzy about leaving their money at the bank. We said, we should come up with something like that. And so we came up with uh, CIPIC, the Securities Investor Protection Corporation, 1970. And it established net capital standards for brokers, kind of similar to banks. The net capital standard is based on your, you know, scope of your business larger the scope of your business, the more net capital you're gonna to need to have. This is not a fiscal responsibility, actually I'll do that later, but it's basically the liquid net worth of the broker dealer. I mean, what does the broker dealer look like dead if liquidated by SIPC? Because that's kind of what the point is. The most egregious sins is you can uh, you know, violate net capital. Now there's three ways to uh, violate net capital. Uh, one way to violate net capital that we're gonna be discussing just in a moment here is you don't have a hard dollar amount. The liquid net worth, that's basically the cash and securities of broker deals, what that amounts to. I'm oversimplifying, but until I get to the net capital lecture, that'll do for now. 
And very rarely does a broker dealer fail because they can't come with a hard dollar amount, whatever it is. The second standard is how much you can owe customers and others for every dollar net capital. That's where most broker dealers struggle. And, you know, the ag that's called aggregate indebtedness. And the aggregate indebtedness of a, a new firm, its first year of operation, can only owe customers and others eight to one. Uh, that's, again, not the point of this lecture. Right now. Why not? You know, uh, 12 to one is when an established firm goes into early warning, $12 in aggregate indebtedness for every dollar. And as an established firm, you can't go past $15 in aggregate indebtedness for every dollar you have. So the ratio is usually what gets a broker dealer in trouble. The other uh, standard for net capital, those are three, and this wouldn't be appropriate, or I guess wouldn't be in, uh, something to consider unless you have a subordinated loan. And that last one is debt to equity. You know, broker dealer can't have debt to equity that exceeds 70% for more than 90 days. So we'll just stipulate in this discussion that this market making firm that we're discussing, this market making firm that we're discussing doesn't have any issues with the, uh, the other things, you know, the AI to net capital number, or the uh, debt to equity, who knows, maybe it doesn't even have a subordinated loan. So the minimum net capital for a market maker, if we wanna be a market making firm, our minimum net capital is 100,000. And that, I consider that to be kind of a floor, right? What I mean by that is even I'm making market in one stock for $5 less, it's not a 1,000, it's not 101,000, it's 100,000. So you'd expect a question where they put you under the floor and you gotta recognize that the minimum net capital for a market making firm is 100,000. Now, be careful because if we're a clearing firm and a market making firm, you know, clearing firms need $250,000 in net capital. So you have to rise and meet whatever your highest standard is. So, you know, uh, we're just assuming this firm is a market making firm. It's just making markets. It's not, not a clearing firm. And there's a maximum of a million. I consider that to think of, I think of that like a ceiling. And then for every security we're making a market in that's $5 or less, we need a thousand per security, and for any stock that we're making a market in that's uh, over twenty five hundred, looks like I got a typo. Uh, I've decided that the best way to proceed is fix typos on the fly. There we go. Uh, more than twenty five hundred. Now, if SIPIC liquidates our inventory, right? Because that's what this means. That the main part of this cash and securities that's the main, major part of that capital. Uh, they may not get the kind of money they'd like for the inventory. And these are recognition test questions. So the basic haircut I'm gonna take is 15%. So for example, let me get out my annotation tool here. If I have a, an $80,000 inventory position, my most basic haircut would be to take 15% of that. And my haircut, I'm gonna write it down by, what would that be, $12,000? So on my uh, report to my regulators, uh, I'm just gonna make sure I use my calculator. You don't have to do the arithmetic on this on 24, if you ever join me for a 27 financial operations principal exam, then you're going to have to do this. So 80,000 uh, minus 12,000. So I'm gonna carry that as the financial operations principal at 68,000. Gives us uh, plenty of uh, room to maneuver. So we're gonna take haircuts on the inventory. The inventory means, you know, that's what we have, right? We're making markets, so we have inventory and securities. Uh, if there's less than three market makers, the haircut goes to 40%. Now, I think that makes sense when you think about it, because if I'm a SIPC uh, trustee and there are three market makers and I shut down one of the three, the other two remaining market makers are gonna say, ooh, I bet that SIPC trustee is gonna start dumping that stock on the market and they're gonna drop their bids dramatically. So the haircut on that position would be a 40%. In fact, as you're fin up, I might come to you as a 24 and say, hey, listen, can you tell the trading guys to try and trade that flat? You know, there's three market makers and there's a lot of financial operations principal like me having the same discussion with every 24 that I'm having with you about, you know, one more person drops off that screen and it goes to 40. You know, uh, we have firm commitment underwritings, firm commitment underwritings. Another word for a firm commitment underwriting is an open contractual commitment. You know, a lot of people forget that the Facebook uh, deal, the IPO was a little wobbly. Now I, I joke, 
IPO is either going to stand for instant profit opportunity, instant profit opportunity, if it's hot, or it's going to stand for it's probably overpriced if it's sticky. We have a hard time getting rid of it. Now, as far as the issuer is concerned, that stock is sold. So, you know, uh, Michael Grimes was the banker of Morgan Stanley on the Facebook deal. And a lot of people thought, gee, I wonder why Zuckerberg doesn't look so con- uh, worried about this. You know, Facebook shows is its secondary trading been new NASDAQ, and that's what we're going to be talking about primarily today, right? Anyways, um, Michael Grimes said, hey, you know, with Zuckerberg says, as far as I'm concerned, that stock is sold at 38. You know, it sounds like uh, Morgan Stanley's problem, not our problem, <laughs> which is correct. You know, Morgan Stanley ended up uh, spending $200 million of their own capital stabilizing that issue. We'll talk about that later. But whatever we don't sell is going to go into inventory. And so the 30% is for the initial public offering and what we call an open contractual commitment, also known as a firm commitment. Now, if we have any uh, tentative net capital, let's just get a whiteboard here. So, you know, if we're looking at our inventory, let's say that we have $100,000. Let's say we have a million dollars in tentative net capital. Again, I'm just illustrating this, not because you're going to have to do it. I just want to give you an idea what's going on. But I would be very, very familiar as a 24 with this term tentative net capital. You know, that means before haircuts, before haircuts. I haven't haircut it in the inventory position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shop through my inventory list as your financial operations principal. And I'm going to look for any one position that exceeds 10% of our tenant impact net capital. And so uh, maybe as I go through our inventory, I see uh, $200,000 worth of treasury bonds. Listen, a SIPC trustee would love if there's $200,000 worth of treasury bonds. It doesn't apply to exempt securities. On your exam, whenever they say exempt securities, they mean on the exam, uh, government bonds, government securities, and municipal securities. That's what that means phraseology-wise on the 24. Means other things in other exams, but that's what it means on the 24. So let's say that I see um, $175,000 in inventory in uh, BIRD. Now, uh, all BIRDs is a NASDAQ security going public. And I say, okay, well, gee, 175,000 bucks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the 175,000 inventory position and I'm going to times that by my haircut, my original haircut, which in this case is 15%. So 175,000 times 15%. So that's going to be uh, 26,250. Again, you shouldn't be doing any of this because test question, you're not a financial operations principal. This is not, you know, your, your job. So that's our original haircut. Now, the amount that exceeds, I'm not going to make you take a double hit in terms of the rules here. So the amount that exceeds here is uh, 75,000, right? There's the 100. It was 10%. There's that. So we take our haircut. The amount that exceeds 75,000. So I'm going to take an additional haircut of 100% of the original. So another 15% only on the amount that exceeds, only on the amount that exceeds. And so that'd be times 15 cent again. It's going to be 11,250. So my total haircut on this uh, inventory position is going to be 26,250 plus 11,250, 37,5 on the amount that exceeds. Again, this is a recognition question. I wouldn't worry about this. I just want to give you an example of that. So we have 10% of any tenant uh, position that is more than 10% of 10 net capital. That's what we're going to do. So uh, here I give you some aim and shoot point and click uh, questions. All of these could be the right answer depending on what you're being asked. You know, 50,000 is the minimum capital for a fully disclosed broker dealer accepting customer funds and securities for prompt forwarding to the clearing firm. And that's not what we're talking about in this lecture. We're talking about market makers. And we say the minimum is 100. 250 is the minimum net capital. Remember, there's others, but the hard dollar amount for a clearing broker dealer. They would have asked the minimum net capital for a clearing broker dealer is 250. And then remember, the ceiling would be a million. The ceiling would be a million. Uh, Here's our basic haircuts. These are even shoot point and click. 
the most common haircut for inventory securities is remember all these could have been the right answer to a different question you know i could have said um, if any one inventory position of a broker dealer exceeds how much of tenant net capital you know what percentage of net capital would require an additional haircut that would have been 10 that's the undue concentration right if i said the haircut for an open contractual commitment that would have been 30 percent. and if i said a haircut for a security in which there's a limited market, and what we said limited market means, limited market at less than three market makers. That would be 40%. All right, so uh, we have our net capital standard met. Uh, we decided we want to make a market in a particular security. Uh, let's look at the uh, this particular security. We're getting ready to go and enter a quote. But before we enter a quote, let's just... Uh, see what an order entry firm is looking at. So right now we have uh, three market makers in the security. So it's uh, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and Knight. Those are what are called their market participant IDs. It's kind of like a vanity license plate. And as an order entry firm, that's what you're going to see. An order entry firm is a firm that does not have securities and in inventory. You know, and if my customer wants to sell, let's just make sure we're clear on that. You know, when I told you the reason I decided to make this lecture first is because when people uh, struggle uh, with this, it's usually because of the uh, quotes. I got the quotes upside down backwards. So this is the price at which market makers buy. And this is the price at which market makers sell. And boy, you gotta get you know really good on this. You know, either gonna get inside looking out or you're gonna get, you know, uh, outside looking in. And outside looking in can be very dangerous. You're not really consistent. Uh, just to be clear here, let's just make sure we understand that the customer sells at this price and the customer buys at this price. Now, I wouldn't be opposed on your scratch paper on the exam if you actually uh, do that. Do that. You know, I think a way to remember it is whenever a customer is looking at two prices, the customer always pays the high price, always receives the low price. What's that called? The securities industry. That's how we make our living, the difference between what we buy things at and we sell things at. You know, I think a good analogy, a good analogy is perhaps the uh, car business, right? A car dealer, a car dealer is trading against customers. And if I go into my car dealer and I'd say, hey, listen, uh, how much for Lincoln Navigator? He goes 90 grand. I go, great, I've got one. Where's my $90,000? He says, well, Dean, I misunderstood you. Uh, I thought you wanted to turn money into a navigator and I gave you my ask or offer price. Now I understand you want to turn securities back into money. You need my bid price, you know, 50 grand. I said, oh my God, what's that called? Because Dean, that's called the spread. I was going to be a broker, but I heard about that 5% policy and the code of conduct. What's that all about? I'm joking. But, you know, <laughs> We're talking about NASDAQ, which is the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotation System. Uh, that alone is a test question. Let's put that over here. OTC markets can best be characterized as negotiated quota of markets. And, you know, the other reason I chose to do this marketplace and not like New York is because there's less shenanigans on the New York, right? Because New York is an auction order to market. They're just matching buyers and sellers and they're not trading against customers here. Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs and Knight Securities are trading against customers. Now, if you're an order entry firm, you would have a level two display. Because, you know, you don't need to input information. You're not going to put in a quote as we just said, we're going to here in a minute, uh, put in a quote as a market maker. But as an order entry firm, you would just be looking at this screen and seeing all the various mark makers, there's three here. So uh, Mark Morgan Stanley says they're willing to buy 800 shares, 800 shares.
into their inventory. That's called the size of the goat, eight round lots, 800 shares. So Morgan Stanley says we're willing to buy 800 shares in our inventory at 15. We're willing to sell 700 shares out of our inventory at 1510. Uh, Goldman Sachs says they're willing to buy 1,000 shares into their inventory at 1501. They're willing to sell 900 shares out of their inventory at 1511. Uh, Knight Security says they're willing to buy 11 round lots, 1,100 shares into their inventory at 1502, and they're willing to sell 800 shares out of their inventory at 1512. Okay, so as an order entry firm, if I'm looking at this electronic chalkboard, you know, in the old days before there were electronics, it was a physical chalkboard. And if you went into, uh, you know, uh, Lucas Turner and Company in 1854 in San Francisco, you'd see Bill, Billy Sherman behind the uh, counter. You'd look up at his uh, chalkboard and he'd have a quote for a particular security. And you give him money, he'd give you the securities over the counter or vice versa. Now we're all hooked up telephonically, electronically. But uh, if I'm an order entry firm, it looks like I should call uh, Knight if my customer wants to sell. And if my customer wants to buy, it looks like I should call Morgan Stanley. And then remember, the size of this quote is going to be 11, 11 by 7. And that's what level one uh, displays. I mean, you know, on my smartphone, I really don't need to see who's got what quote. So level one on net data feed. So we have three levels of NASDAQ data feeds we're held accountable for. And if what I, my subscription is, is a NASDAQ level one data feed, it shows the highest bid and the lowest ask. And it shows the size, 11 by seven. All right, so uh, we're getting ready to input our quote. So we, as a market maker, we have a level three uh, NASDAQ data feed. Uh, by the way, the order entry firm with your buy or sell, and the test assumes there's commissions, right? So there wouldn't be you know, both. Now, if you're a Morgan Stanley customer, one of the advantages of being a Morgan Stanley customer is you could buy that stock at 1510 and not trade a, uh, pay a commission. Now, we're all called broker dealers, but in any one trade, we're either going to be acting our broker agency capacity or our dealer principal capacity. We can't never be both very testable. You can't be a broker and a dealer in the same trade. You know, and if you're a uh, Goldman Sachs customer, right, you pay 1511 and you don't know commission. Uh, whoop, let me clean up my slide here. Okay, so entering quotes using our level three NASDAQ data feed. That's testable, right? So here we come. Uh, I'm getting ready to put in a quote. Here comes uh, our firm and boom, watch out world. Here we come. Watch out world, here we come. So uh, first thing is I can't uh, put in here 1510. That would be cool if I, Dean Tenney and Company, I'm just making this up. My market participant ID would be Dean. Woohoo, that'd be fun. And let's see. So I'm getting ready to put in my quote. I couldn't put in a quote that would lock the market. You know, a lock, very testable, is when the lowest bid equals, excuse me, the highest bid. Let me get rid of that. The highest bid equals the lowest ask. So, you know, right now uh, I couldn't go to 1510. I could go to uh, 1509 would be the, as far, far as I could go in putting this quote in there. So let's boom. I could go to 59. If, by the way, if I want to go higher than that, uh, I would call up Morgan Stanley and I would say trade or move, trade or move. Uh, by the way, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, uh, Knight might be upset here because I just took the spread from eight cents. The spread is the difference, by, right? This, you know, they have individual spreads. Morgan Stanley's individual spread right now is uh, 10 cents, but the spread before we did this, remember, was eight cents. And, you know, market makers aren't supposed to collude. They're not supposed to go and say, hey, Dean, it's not your turn today. Welcome to our thing. Uh, your day will be Thursday when you get the inside quote. No. So I could go to 1509. Now I joke, this is only a test issue in this next example, right? 
Because if you did this in the real world, people would just jump you and say, you must be new. But this is where I say, you know, I say, uh, boom, boom, boom. I go 15, 15. <laughs> you know, all these guys are going to crack up. You know, Morgan Stanley's going to say, Dean, I'm willing to sell 700 shares at 1510. Why would you want to pay 1515 when you can pay 1510? You must be new. So that would be a cross. A cross is when the highest bid is greater than the lowest ask. And it's very testable to recognize this. It's very testable to know whose responsibility is with the level three NASDAQ data feed to well, you make sure this doesn't happen. It's the market maker that's considering entering the quote, right? So. You know, maybe the issuer calls me and says, hey, Dean, I don't like Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Knight. How about I pay you so you don't have to risk your own capital to be a market maker in my security? Test question. Market makers can't uh, receive payments from issuers for making the market. So I got to be risking my own capital in these transactions. Uh, riskless principle uh, trade, riskless principle. So, you know, if uh, you're looking at these quotes, instead of buying this from Morgan Stanley at 1510, so again, you're an order entry firm. You're not one of these three market makers. You're an order entry firm. And so maybe you decide to buy this from Morgan Stanley at 1510. Instead of uh, charging your customer a commission, you mark it up 1511. That's called a riskless principal trade. I just bought it from Morgan Stanley. And then I put a penny as a markup into it and charged the customer 1511 as a riskless principal. Two test points. In a riskless principal trade, I got to disclose that. Now I say, hey, Chris, I got it off the box at uh, 1510 from Morgan Stanley. I put a penny in there and uh, marked it up a penny. 1511 is what you paid. You know, you pay the asking price. You know, he said, why'd you do that? And I said, well, a penny per share is less than my commission would have been. I don't have to have that reason. That's a good one, but that's not the point. The point is I have to disclose that. All right, so let's uh, look at another scenario. You know, what I'm hoping is that, uh, you know, maybe at the end of this, you feel a little uh, more comfortable about this discussion on your Series 24. And, you know, this has got a pause button. You can repeat it. You can do whatever. So here comes Dean again. Here comes Dean. And let's say I put in my uh, quote. So that's my market participant ID. And I put in uh, 1499, uh, 15, 13, uh, 50 by 50. Watch out. So a trade through is any trade that takes place, takes place outside of the inside quote. So that's what a trade through is. Now, you know, your first thing should would say it should be bad if the order entry firm sells the customer stock to Dean, the market maker Dean, for fourteen ninety nine. Given that there was a bid, somebody was willing to pay fifteen oh two. So you know, your default should be that sounds bad. Given that there was somebody willing to buy the stock at fifteen oh two, why did the order entry firm? Why did you sell it at fourteen ninety nine? Right in our example previously. Uh, trade through is any trade outside the inside quote? Well, one good answer would be size, right? As a market maker, as that order entry firm, you said, well, Dean was displaying, he's good for 50 round lots, round lots, 105,000 shares. And so I hit Dean for the entire 5,000 at 1499, because I was afraid by the time I hit Knight, 1100 shares there, then Goldman, then Morgan Stanley, by the time I got, they would see me coming, those quotes would be moving through, uh, moving away from me. So size would be one good reason uh, why you had a trade through, but it, default should be the trade throughs uh, are bad. Trade throughs are bad. All right, so uh, here, uh, interpositioning again. Interpositioning, let me get out my text. Uh, let's, you know, they probably should do all the text on all of these. Oh, let me clean up this line. And let me get my annotation tool. Let me get my text. And a trade through is a trade outside 
the inside quote. Remember, you should be real comfortable with that language at some point. The inside quote or inside market is the highest bid and the lowest ask, right? You know, in our example we're looking at right now, that's the inside quote. So any trade there or outside that is going to be problematic. And we said there's a good reason for that, but you better have some reason why you did that. Now, inner positioning is putting a third party into trade. So let's put that in here. And that's another one you got to be a little careful about. Because, you know, that may or may not, that may or may not be a problem. So that's another one you got to be a little careful. So, you know, maybe uh, I'm a smaller order entry firm, you're a larger order entry firm. And I say, listen, I bet if you called, you'd get a better quote than I would. You know, that's perfectly okay about putting a third party into the trade if a better execution results. You know, I use the story of my brother. My brother went to buy a blue face Submariner Rolex. And, you know, I said, why don't you uh, have Lewis do that for you? He said, well, why would I put Lewis in front, uh, in between me and the jeweler? I said, well, he's a much better customer. I mean, he buys all kinds of fancy watches from him. You don't, you know, buy any. They're going to see you once. Why don't you send down, him down there? And, you know, he got, Chris got what he thought was a good execution, a better execution than he certainly would have got if he'd walked into that jeweler as just some stranger off the street. And, you know, I thought it was funny. He asked me, well, who did I get the watch from? Did I get it from Lewis or from the jeweler? I said, what do you care if it's new? It's got a warranty. And I'll be honest with you, though, if you have a problem with it, I give it back to Lewis. Let him go down there and, work, you know, work it out because, you know, they're going to treat him much better than us, right? Now, what would not be okay is if I'm just putting a third party in there to justify a bigger markup, right? So, for example, maybe I'm a Chevrolet dealer. Uh, unbeknownst to you, I have the exact Corvette you've just asked for in the back lot. And I said, well, there's only one here. I'm coming to you from Las Vegas. There's only one in the Las Vegas metropolitan area. And uh, my, buddy, my buddy, the dealer in uh, North Las Vegas has it out in Summerlin. So, you know, you're going to have to pay a bigger markup, but uh, I'll tell you what, I'll call and tell him you're on the way and, uh, you know, try and do good and do, do right by it. And I call him and he says, what's up? I said, I, I got this guy who wants a, you know, Corvette and he goes, well, I don't have one. I say, no, my porter's on the way with it. Now, in that case, that's a violation, right? The only uh, person now in the trade for the third parties to justify our markup. So this example would be something like where uh, I have a customer who wants the security and I call you and say, hey, mark it up to me 100%. I'm not a customer and then I'll mark it up to him 5% and we'll split the hidden profit. Boy, on this test, you hear the word hidden profit. That's, that's bad. I say, and then Finner asked you, did you ever charge a customer more than 5%? You can say no. If they ask me if I charge a customer more than 5%, I can say no. <laughs> so that would be an example where that would not be a copacetic. Let me clean up my slide. Okay, uh, customer limit order display system here. So as you can see here, let's go over this again. So there's the market maker, I'm Dean. Uh, I'm the market maker in this stock. This is my quote, 1504, 1510. Uh, once again, once again, I'm willing to buy 900 shares here at 1504 into inventory and sell 900 shares out of inventory at 1510. Now you gotta be careful on this one. And let's just get our annotation tool again in our text. You know, we said here, uh, market maker buys it. And that's still true here. And we said uh, market maker sells here. And that's still true. And we said the customer is usually on the opposite side. So, you know, if this was just a market order, so what I mean by that is if the customer here, let me get my, wants to buy in a market order, he'd pay that. And if he wants to sell, he'd pay that if this was a market order. But please know it's not a market order. In a customer limit order,
uh, customers on the same side. You know, um, we had a customer got really, really, really mad at us. Really mad. His name was Mr. Manning. And what Mr. Manning uh, got upset about is he'd give his broker a limit order and then I would just sit on it and I would you know, not do anything with it. I'd wait till I bought it for me and then I would do something. So when a customer gives me a limit order, if he's going to be willing to buy or sell with a limit order, by the way, he doesn't have to tell me, I don't have to say limit order. He can just tell me 1504. It's my job as the broker to know what that's a limit order. And so if the customer is willing to pay the same price or better than me, I have to display the order. And so it, I'm willing to buy at uh, 1504 and the customer is willing to buy at 1504. So let's put that up here. This is a customer buy limit. As we said, the point here is now the customer is on the same side of the market as me and the market maker. By the way, if you can, if you can practice and get it, get it down from the market maker's perspective, you'll be in much better shape uh, on the test. You know, that just comes with practice, drilling and rehearsing, right? So uh, now I'm gonna have to update this display here because uh, I'm willing to buy at 1504. The governor is willing to buy at 1504. By the way, I would have no obligation if you wanted to buy at 1503. So Dean, why are you not, Mr. Manning says, why are you not displaying my buy limit at 1503? I said, well, right now your buy limit is not competitive. I'm willing to pay 1504. So if he's willing to buy at 1504 or 1505, I'd have to update my display. Now this looks like when I update my display here, which I'm gonna to have to do here, I'm gonna update the display. Let me. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to update that display and show not only 900 I want, but the thousand he wants. So that's what my new display is going to look like is 19, right? The 900 I originally wanted to uh, buy into my inventory and the thousand that Mr. Manning wants to buy. Now, moving forward, moving forward, I have the same obligation to protect him on this limit order. So again, you can get jammed up on 24. It's not what is best best practice it's what's my minimum ethical responsibility so you know if for example now i buy 500 shares for me at 1504 i have to buy 500 shares for mr manning at 1504 so the minimum obligation is whatever i do for me i'm going to have to do for him as you recall it was a thousand so i still have that same obligation moving forward now if i get lucky if i get lucky and maybe I get it at 1503, I'd have to pass to do the same for him as well, right? So if I get 500 years at 1503, 500 for me, 500 for Mr. Manning. Now, good news, you can rewind this, you know, go back and see how I just updated that display. That's the great thing about uh, videos, right? I was showing that I was willing to buy nine by nine, and now I have to display the customer's uh, limit order. So he's on the same side as me and the limit orders. That was the other thing we said. Let's put that back up there. So this is a common thing. You know, when I have the aha factor sometimes in 24, it's usually this, this idea of the quotes and whose perspective. So let's put this here. Or this is where now the limit order is on the same side as the market maker. Let me get a different color. Oh. Let me run the other example. The customer is on the other side. So if he just gives me a limit order, it would look much different. So you got to be careful uh, on your exam when what you see is a customer limit order. 
Now, uh, even after we passed limit order protection rules, there were still a lot of shenanigans going on. You know, because I'd say, well, no, no, it looks like I did something wrong, but you know, I didn't get uh, Mr. Manning's buy limit for a thousand at fifteen oh four until you know eleven fifteen, and uh, you know, I had bought it into for myself at uh, you know ten thirty. You know, O stands for, and it prevents the shenanigans from. Well, I shouldn't say it prevents all the shenanigans. You know, on the test, you got to believe in human depravity and original sin. Uh, boom. That stands for the Order Audit Trail System. And it tracks uh, NASDAQ uh, trades from interest to, from, uh, you know, entry to acceptance to execution the whole way through, right? And uh, they'll say, well, Dean, Oates shows differently. You know, that's for NASDAQ. So Oates shows, Dean, that you got Mr. Manning's order at 1115. You know, we, we have one for bonds that kind of does the same thing. That's called Trace. That's the trade... Uh, reporting compliance engine that's for debt securities we're trying to you know drive uh, get the bond guys into the modern era but uh, debt securities trade over the counter too and uh trace is kind of weird because usually the sell side reports very testable we have to report trades in 10 seconds but you know bond guys <laughs> 10 seconds i can't do it <laughs> so this is dual side reporting and it's uh, 15 minutes and then the last one I would be, you know, aware of is Emma, and that's uh, for electronic municipal market assets. That's for for munis. You know, you'd be prepared for like an A, B, C, D kind of question. All right. So a markup or markdown is based on the inside market or the quote. So remember what the inside market or quote is: the highest bid and the lowest ask. So right now, again, you should get comfortable with what that is right now. Boom, boom. So, you know, uh, if if uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, sell, well, I'll just put me up here again. So here comes Dean. And maybe I put in 1495, 1515. So the markup is based on the inside quote. And so let's just get our text thing out of here. Mark down is highest bid. Markdown. down is lowest ask. So right now I just, uh, the highest uh, bid was 1502. So the markdown was seven cents here. Let me get out my, and my mark up is five cents. Okay, so uh, one of the rules of a market making firm is that uh, I have to, as a minimum display, have one by one. That's testable. So, you know, my minimum display would be 100 shares. You know, I don't know of any market maker who would want to do just 100 shares. I mean, you're going to set up this thing, but that's the minimum and that's testable. Now, right now, remember that my size of my quote, my size of my quote is nine by nine. And so I have to honor size. So, you know, if the order entry firm calls me and says, Dean, what's your quote? I say my quote is 1504, 1510. And uh, they say we're selling. So remember again, now we're back to the scenario where a customer is using a market order. MM means market maker, right? So I'm willing to buy at 1504. I'm willing to sell at 1510. Order entry firm has a market order and they say, Dean, we're selling 900 shares. And I say, oh, I changed my mind. So, you know, you're going to get some practical application of this where, you know, it looks like I'm uh, not honoring my firm quote. And they say, Dean, are you on a, uh, failing on a firm quote? I say, I am. Test question, very testable. That's called backing away. 
Backing away is when a market maker fails to honor a firm quote. So I'd be backing away hundreds of minimum, but if, if you, uh, you know, I'm not backing away if you say, Dean, we're selling a thousand. I say, whoa, first I've heard of a thousand. I'm only good for 900. That's not backing away. But if you know anything 900 or less selling 800 or 700, I got to honor that. I got to honor that. I say, what are you going to do about it? You know, it doesn't do any good if you think I'm violating a rule and you don't know what I've done. You say, well, Dean, under the code of procedure, under the code of procedure, I'm going to contact the Department of Enforcement. Very testable Department of Enforcement of FINRA is the one who handles trade practice because uh, complaints like backing away. You know, FINRA is organized in various districts. My firm was in District 1. So District 1 has a Department of Enforcement. They say, Dean, we've had some reports here not honoring your quotes. Could you come explain yourself? And, you know, Department of Enforcement, a FINRA can find me. FINRA members a self-regulatory organization. They can send suspend me. They can expel me. You know, they can bar me. Stupid but test, well, they don't have a badge and a gun, right? It's, a, it's an SRO, self-regulatory organization. Now, if I think that was unfair, if I think that was unfair, then I can uh, contact the uh, Department of uh, Appeal to the National Judiciary Council. I can appeal to the SEC and ultimately court if, you know, uh, I don't want to take my punishment. Or don't believe it's fair. I should be a better way to explain that. I've seen people appeal and win. It takes a lot of money, a lot of resources, and you're usually making people matter as you go up the, uh, the chain of command. Uh, trades, I said, that's testable. Trades are going to be reported in uh, 10 seconds to either the trade reporting facility, the alternative display facility, or the order counter reporting facility. Don't get too hung up on what happens. You know, it, It's more testable what we've been talking on the front end than the back end plumbing and what happens then. Very testable. Other reports we make are daily volume reports, very testable. Uh, twice monthly reports on the short positions of both my customers and my own proprietary accounts, my own proprietary uh, positions that are short. So that's both customers and the firm, very testable. All right, so in NASDAQ, uh, sometimes we'll see on our screen uh, T1, and that means news is pending. Again, very testable. We get this, this will be a name and shoot point and click question, right? News pending. A T2 means the news has been released. So now we look at that and we decide what that means. And then we start entering our quotes on T3. T3 would be something like uh, 10, 10.05. It's usually a five minute window. And that's when we start entering our quotes. Now, remember, as we start to re-enter our quotes for this NASDAQ stock that's been halted, you know, we got to kind of make sure we, again, don't walk or cross the market. So, but that's, uh, you know, very testable. And it's just, again, aim and shoot, point and click. You know, the, the three styles of questions on 24 are recognition. That's flashcard stuff. You know, stuff you just either know or you don't. Um, practical application. You know, that's how, how do we uh, update the display, that kind of stuff. And then judgment questions, those are where you go, oh, man, I don't know, what do I do with that? What do I do with it? Withdrawals from NASDAQ. So you want to withdraw from NASDAQ, very testable. You know, uh, I'm dating myself, but before we had rules about excuse withdrawal, we had all kinds of people would do unexcused withdrawal. They'd just take their keyboard and all of a sudden I disappear from the screen. You know, in, in Black Monday in 87, for example, the New York Stock Exchange guy said, hey, at least we were here. You know, at least the auction didn't fail. I mean, we were all here prepared to buy stock. Those NASDAQ got guys just disappeared. So if uh, we apply and receive permission, we can have up to five business days. That's testable. You know, when I put a TQ on the screen, that doesn't mean you're going to verbatim get that. TQ stands for test questions. It means expect a question around this area, right? Uh, acceptable reasons. Uh, you say, hey, my 57 trader guy yeah, was in a car accident or something. Uh, that's reasonable. We're having technical difficulties. That's reasonable. Uh, I don't think it uh, would be fair for me to be trading when I'm in possession of material non-public information. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. We've uh, uh, lose our clearing agreement. Nobody clear our trades on an involuntary basis. That would not be bueno. Now that's different than you just don't want to make a market in this stock anymore. So that's much different than you just don't want to make a stock, uh, market in this stock anymore. So voluntary termination, we would draw the quotes and then test question, we can't uh, come back on there for 20 days. I kind of think of it like you're in a penalty box, so to speak. 
Stabilizing bids, very testable. I probably shouldn't say this, but I think of it as a legal form of pegging. A legal form of pegging. You know, Morgan Stanley pegged the price of Facebook at 38. So as I mentioned, that was an open contractual commitment, a firm commitment underwriting with, uh, with, uh, with um, Facebook. And the syndicate told Facebook they were so confident they could sell the securities that they would buy them personally. So as far as the issuer is concerned, that stock is sold. So first test questions, we can only do stabilizing bids and firm commitment underwritings only. It has to be disclosed in the prospectus. Now it's better to have in the prospectus and not need it than need it and not have it. Only one market maker can enter the stabilizing bid. So, you know, usually we call them the stabilization agent. So we're gonna pick one of the members of our syndicate who's going to do this. It uh, shows up on the chalkboard as a one-sided quote. So we know that this is, you know, being stabilized. You know, if you were my customer, you said, Dean, man, the damnedest thing, the stock's been at 38 for the last day or so. I said, well, I'd sell it now because once they get rid of all the stock they can, They'll remove the stabilizing pit bid. It will find its natural price. It's got to be at or below the public offering price. You know, because we can't be clever. We put it at above the public offering price. People would think instead of being sticky, that it's hot. Those aren't test terms. That's just, you know, insider lingo for this. You know, if it's a hot issue, we got different problems. This is not hot. <laughs> you know, we're having a problem getting rid of it. It's sticky. You now, Michael Grimes at the end of day one of Facebook's IPO. He said, we spent $200 million stabilizing Facebook today at 38. Tomorrow, we will remove our stabilizing bid and it will find its natural price. Now, you know, Morgan Stanley doesn't lose $200 million often. So when they do, the rest of us go, yeah. You know, they went up to old Facebook 38 and thus they uh, thought it was going to be good. So we're doing a follow-on. So, you know, as an investment banker, uh, we uh, take the company public. They choose NASDAQ as their market center. You know, and now it's trading in NASDAQ and I'm the Series 57. I'm the one, uh, you know, putting in the bids and the ask. I got that level three NASDAQ data feed. And now we're going to do a follow on, follow on uh, offering. You know, the shelf registration is going to be good. Better to have securities on the shelf at the SEC and not need them and need them not have them. So, you know, what we do is for the follow on is we take what's called take down our shelf. And so we're doing a follow on offering either two years or three years is how good that shelf is depending on you know, what kind of issue we're at. You know, if I'm a well-known seasoned issuer of securities, it's three years and it's immediately effective. All right, anyways, onward and upward. It's kind of a conflict to be participating in the primary market at the same time that I'm uh, participating in the secondary market. So compliance comes to me and says, Dean, on the series 57, I'm the one entering the quotes. And says, Dean, would you like to ask for an excused withdrawal or would you like to go passive? You know, would you like to, you know, take, uh, get off the screen or would you like to go passive? I said, well, I'd like to go passive. So, if, by the way, this is only for a restricted security. I mean, if this is a security, then, you know, there not be, may not be a restricted period because if there's a, you know, huge amount of volume and float, there's, this isn't a conflict that would have any kind of consequence. So, you know, for actively traded securities, there may not be a restricted period, but let's assume there is. If there is a restricted period, what does it mean to go passive? I can't have a bid higher than the highest bid of a market maker who's not a syndicate member. So what that means is I can't have the, what that means in English is I can't really have the insight quote, right? That's what that means. And so, you know, one of my institutional customers says, hey, Dean, I notice you usually you have a, you know, a more competitive quote. I go, well, what can I tell you? I'm passive right now. Well, can you try to go? Absolutely. I'm so glad you called. In fact, I'll give you an even better deal that you called me. So what does that mean? And what you got to be able to do is know what this passive means. So uh, they get delisted from NASDAQ. You know, to, you get booted. You get booted from uh, NASDAQ, uh, you know, for example, not being current on your financials or whatever it happens to be. Well, it looks like I got another slide to fix here. And so now they go to the uh, bulletin board or pink sheets. Bulletin board, they still have to be current, but for whatever reason, fallen angels, right? Oh, I just, man, I'm really struggling on this slide here. Um, you know, I think of them as fallen angels. 
No, I uh, taught a lot of 24s in San Francisco. And you know, a lot of the guys are NASDAQ market makers. And for many, many years, they had no idea about the bulletin board or the pinks or any of that stuff. And then after there was an implosion in the dot-com era, they all knew who they were. Now, usually if we want to make a market in a non-NASDAQ over-the-counter stock, we would have to file a Form 211. Uh, but there's an exception. If I was their market maker 30 days prior to them getting booted from NASDAQ to the Bolton Board or Pink Sheets, I can follow them down there. So, you know, uh, Fenris says, Dean, you never filed a Form 211. I see you're making a market in the security. Well, you know, what'd you do? And how, how are you up there without the Form 211? And, you know, the two ways to do it, if I was a market maker, I'm piggybacking. You know, again, this is an overview uh, presentation. It's not, I'm not going to get too much in the weeds with it. Remember, our lectures are supplemental to your coming to class for two days for Dean with the 24. I'm coming to you at, uh, at um, September, early September, and then I'll be teaching a two-day 24, October 2021 and November 2021, if you want to join me for class. But anyway, so again, this is just kind of an overview. And I told you I chose this because usually market making is where uh, some of the people who struggle on 24 struggle because they come from a, a package product background. Okay, so I think I brought that in at just under uh, an hour. That's kind of my game plan when I'm doing lectures is to kind of bring them in at a study block time. You know, uh, I suggest you should uh, carve your time into study block and then uh, do that. So um, like, uh, comment, I'm pretty good at responding to questions in the comments. If you have comments, uh, I'm pretty good at responding to that. Subscribe so you don't miss future installments. The next installment will be on net capital because those are the two areas I think I can be most helpful given that I'm not going to do a two day 24 on the YouTube channel. I'm going to throw up a couple of narrative lectures and do a, maybe I'll do a 24 explication. That's my plan at this particular uh, point. So um, your feedback is appreciated. So if you have other things besides net capital that you need some help on, I'm more than happy to entertain uh, lecture suggestions. We've had some very good uh results with lectures I never thought would speak to people, but people suggest them, I do them. <laughs> they have a good audience. I'm not as concerned about audiences, uh, large, um, size of audience for nines, tens, and 24s. It's a different audience. And what I'm hoping, and I've been very blessed, and I, I want to thank uh, those of you who refer people. Uh, but I think one of the things that has uh, made the channel so successful in the little eight months we've been around is that there are lots of nines and tens and 24s that I've helped uh, make their mark. And, and uh, you know, it's pretty simple. They make their mark, they're happy. And then, you know, they know that it's safe for work and they can send people to the channel and same here. So uh, if you've been with me on the channel from your SIE and your seven and your 66 or 63, and now you're taking your 24, I appreciate uh, being part of your journey with you, your testing journey. And uh, I hope uh, that when you uh, pass your exam, you'll send your sevens like i said I, that's the unique thing right you can send five six eight you know, people for their for their sie so even if it's only 124 and that 24 can send me a thousand people you know it's uh worth it okay so i don't think i have anything else for you um uh whoop, where's my little thing thank you